It looks like the fraudulent germ theory narratives are going into overdrive. The latest fear-mongering has moved from non-existent viruses to claimed killer bacteria. Not only that, but the supporting stories involve apparent concerns related to shortages of antibiotics and even antibiotic resistance. The population is being gaslit once again with medico-pharmaceutical industry fraud designed to keep them in perpetual fear of germs and contagion. Unfortunately, those that bought into the pandemic, virus and gain-of-function fantasies are likely to be duped once again. The end result is to draw people back into the allopathic paradigm which misrepresents disease and encourages all manner of unnecessary responses whether they be mainstream or less mainstream. Let's have a look at the latest errors from the germ theorists, including why the medical system has misunderstandings of microbes and what really causes disease. There is a silver lining to this business though. Once you see through the nonsense, you can simply ignore the hype and become even more well equipped to achieve a harmonious state of mind and body. Orthodox medical men have been taught to believe that acute illnesses are diseases, that there are hundreds of different ones, each having a specific causative organism, that nature's glorious redemptive efforts on our behalf are the work of malevolent germs and must be rigorously repressed at all costs. Such colossal stupidity is bad enough but the stubborn refusal to admit what is readily apparent to the average child of tender years can hardly be too sternly pilloried. Dr. Ulrich Williams, Terrain Therapy. On December the 9th, the Daily Mail featured a story. 15 children under 15 have now died from killer strep A complication this winter, as health chiefs say knock-on effects of COVID lockdowns may be to blame for unusually big outbreak. There is so much nonsense in the story that it will be hard to get through all of it, but let's have a look at some of the major claims. They reported that 15 children have now died from strep A in Britain this winter as the killer bug outbreak rumbles on. Strep A bacteria can cause a myriad of infections, including impetigo, scarlet fever and strep throat. The vast majority of cases are mild. In extremely rare cases, however, the bacteria can penetrate the blood and trigger a life-threatening complication. Firstly, what is strep A? It refers to a group of streptococcus bacteria that possess a certain antigen type on their cell wall, and one of the most promoted group A streps is streptococcus pyogenes. The Wikipedia page for streptococcus pyogenes states that they are clinically important for humans as they are an infrequent but usually pathogenic, part of the skin microbiota that can cause group A streptococcal infection. It goes on to state that the bacterium typically colonizes the throat, genital mucosa, rectum and skin. Of healthy individuals, 1 to 5% have throat, vaginal or rectal carriage. In healthy children, such carriage rates varies from 2 to 17%. So the claim that they are quote usually pathogenic is farcical. Even on their own terms they have a problem here because they admit that the vast majority of the time the bacteria are present there is no association with any disease. But I would suggest that they are massively underestimating the actual carriage rates in humans and it would be very surprising if these species were not found in some numbers in 100% of humans. The issue is what they define as detecting the bacterium. Even a mainstream paper published in 2014 stated that, despite over 70 years of observation and research, an exact definition of the group A strep carrier remains elusive. It all depends on which tests are said to detect the bacteria. Traditional cultures from throat or skin swabs, for example, can be used, but particular species will only be detected if there were sufficient bacterial cells to start with, and they are not crowded out by other growth in the culture. And why would they only be found in around 10% of people? 
That makes little sense when we are in constant contact with others and our microbiota are likely to be very similar. What is in flux is the relative amounts of different microbes depending on the body's condition. The reason orthodox medicine classifies group A strep as pathogens is because they are associated with some disease states. The bacteria themselves have no capacity to attack a host. They are merely acting as a cleanup crew when the underlying terrain becomes devitalized or damaged. Well, what about the animal studies, you may ask? Let's take a look at one of the animal models used to study in Pitaigo. In 2000, a paper titled Humanized in Vivo Model for Streptococcal in Pitaigo was published. In this Frankenstein-style experiment, abnormal skid mice had 1cm sections of human neonatal foreskin engrafted onto their bodies. Then after the graft had been in place for four weeks, they were ready for the next phase. This involved damaging the foreskin grafts with either multiple scalpel cuts, duct tape or sandpaper. Then a swab soaked in a group A strep broth was secured over the wounded foreskin tissue. Incredibly, they found that the more they damaged the foreskin, the more pathology they subsequently saw in the tissue. And did they do a valid control experiment? Of course not. The scientific method is not required to advance germ theory dogma. The only quote control experiment they disclosed was a sterile broth application where they compared the type of keratin present in the foreskin graft but made no comment as to whether there was similar tissue damage. Other experimental models consist of similar nonsense which involve compromising the animals in various ways or exposing them to bacterial brews through a route that doesn't replicate what happens in nature. In some cases they are poisoned with toxins that bacteria produce as they are performing their cleanup. In any case, there is no scientific basis to the claim that group A strep causes impetigo. In reality, impetigo is not caused by bacteria. It is caused by neglect. This may sound harsh, but it is no surprise that it typically occurs in those who live in poor and crowded circumstances, as well as those with underlying health conditions. The germ theorists claim that it is a highly infectious bacteria passing around. And going back to the Daily Mail article, we see that they are promoting this colourful image, fraudulently claiming that child A coughs up bacteria and that it can, quote, spread between people and infect them, in this case, child B. However, it is clear from the experimental models that the bacterium by itself cannot do anything to a healthy host. Furthermore, no host-to-host -host transmission of any of these diseases can or has ever been demonstrated. Injecting bacterial broths into animals is no demonstration of contagion, no matter what the results. Unfortunately, during clusters of cases, people are easily fooled into believing there is some contagion at play. However, they are simply cases of simultaneous exposure to common health compromising factors. For example, daycare centres are an environment ripe for toxicity due to psychologically stressed children being separated from their families and sometimes placed in unhygienic conditions where dozens of young children are put into a confined space. When several of them get in Batigo in this environment, the germ theory joker card is lazily played. Continuing with the Daily Mail article, they promoted a colourful image depicting what they claim are the symptoms of strep A infection. We can see that things such as rashes, throat inflammation and fevers cannot possibly be classified as specific symptoms. They are simply mechanisms that the body uses to clear toxins. These are all part of the healing crisis as it attempts to correct itself. The Daily Mail reported that UK Health Security Agency, UKHSA data, suggests five times as many infants have been struck down this winter compared to before COVID. But when we have a look at the incidence of so-called invasive group A strep disease, we see that it is around one case per 100,000 people. Even on their own terms, this is clearly a fear-mongering campaign, with something that, in reality, their captive audience has nothing to worry about. Of the 1 in 100,000 incidents, less than 10% of the cases were fatal. So now we are talking about less than 1 in 1 million people. 
In other words, they should be far more worried about dying in a car accident or as a result of obesity. However, the biggest scam, of course, is that there are no cases of group A strep infection. There are only cases of neglect and subsequent treatment follies. To continue the malarkey, the UK HSA opined that, quote, there is usually a surge in invasive group A strep cases every three to four years, but social distancing during the COVID pandemic may have interrupted the cycle and explain the current increase. What's that supposed to mean? Here, they are using one fake story as the apparent reason for another fake story. Anyone buying into the narrative must be doing mental gymnastics to make sense of whether the cult of social distancing might be good or bad for them. The article moves on to report that phenoxymethylpenicillin, amoxicillin and clarithromycin are three antibiotics used to treat strep A infections. Health chiefs have advised doctors to have a low threshold for prescribing these to youngsters who have suspected strep A raising concerns that this could lead to antibiotic resistance when the treatment become less effective against bacteria due to overuse. But the UK HSA today emphasised that antibiotic resistance is not on the rise. Note how they introduce fears of antibiotic resistance while simultaneously saying there is no evidence of this. It's like the lawyer in the courtroom blurting out a claim that the judge then counters as inadmissible evidence. However, by that stage, it's too late and the idea has been placed in the jury's mind. A few days earlier, the Daily Mail had used the same tactic with the headline, Rishi Sunak and Steve Barclay insist there is no shortage of antibiotics amid strep A outbreak, despite pharmacies admitting they're having to turn away patients due to lack of penicillin. After mentioning the word life-threatening a few times, they then paint a picture of, quote, difficulties accessing the life-saving drugs. Again, this article is all about sustaining the myths of germ theory, which attempts to scare parents into thinking that their child could be the next victim of the supposedly unpredictable microbe. They list some children claimed to have been killed by this bacterium, while also admitting that the bacterium is of no consequence to the vast majority of people. There is inadequate information provided to assess why these children died and their stories leading up to the point when they manifested their initial symptoms. However, the fallacious diagnosis of group A strep infection would have been made on the basis of the presence of the bacteria, which as we have seen, cannot be concluded as the reason. It stems from an illogical diagnostic system with the following classifications. 1. The individual is well and group A strep is detected, equals asymptomatic carriage. 2. The individual is unwell and group A strep is detected, equals invasive infection. 3. The individual is unwell and group A strep is not detected, equals other infection. As is apparent in so many other areas of allopathic medicine, it's a diagnostic system embedded within a false paradigm. Unfortunately, the typical health practitioner thinks that the swabs they send to the lab will tell them what is wrong with the individual. An unhelpful label is placed on the hapless patient, and then treatment protocols are followed. Some get better when placed on antibiotics, and some die. To the medical establishment, this doesn't indicate misguided treatment, but indicates how severe the quote, infection was. As terrain theorists, we point out the mistaken belief that bacteria such as Streptococcus have any ability to attack a host. Another quote from Dr. Ulrich Williams that counters the backwards thinking is, why be uncharitable to the defenseless small germs? The germ theorists have painted a picture of dangerous bacteria and a narrative that we are at war with them, needing to remain eternally vigilant. But this is not so. The microbes are invaluable members of our ecosystem, and like other parts of nature, are pro-life. Trying to fight them with antibiotics is mistaken, as it is a distraction from treating the underlying causes of illness. The pharmaceuticals may suppress some symptoms, but this is not because they are a magic bullet claimed to be specifically eliminating one rogue bacterial species. 
Many antibiotics also have anti-inflammatory effects in the body and they certainly have no ability to address the reason the person became sick in the first place. In fact, in many instances, they will make the individual's condition even worse with another unwanted substance that needs to be cleared from the body. Unwell patients need to be helped with detoxification through aiding the body's eliminative roots, which includes through the gastrointestinal tract and skin. Fasting strategies may be required to promote the elimination and deficiencies may need to be corrected with special supplementary diets. In severe cases, intravenous vitamin C and other supportive therapies are indicated. Many of these strategies are outlined in my new book, Terrain Therapy, which has brought back into publication the suppressed work and wisdom of Dr. Ulrich Williams. I would also encourage everyone to read my friend Dawn Lester's article, More About Strep A, What Is Going On, over at the website, What Really Makes You Ill. Dawn covers more of the fear-mongering stories surrounding this issue and provides some commentary on where the narrative seems to be heading. In summary, you have no reason to fear bacteria, but plenty of reasons to be sceptical of those trying to promote this latest quote news. Don't worry about antibiotic shortages as your body certainly doesn't have antibiotic or any other pharmaceutical deficiencies. There is no need to be scared of our essential microbial friends. They are not our enemies and within each of us is the greatest force in getting well. If you enjoyed this video, please visit supportdrsam.com 